Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Francie, uh, Frankie Velasquez, and I am the aviation weather subject matter expert for flight service, safety, and operations policy, and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to welcome Kathleen Eddick, director of the FAA's Flight Service Directorate, for some opening remarks. Thank you, Frankie. And uh, I especially want to thank all of you for joining us today as we discuss FAA's Advisory Circular 91-92, Pilot's Guide to Pre-Flight Briefing. We will also touch on the related WINGS courses that were developed to teach pilots how to conduct pre-flight self-briefings. I am very grateful to have a broad range of aviation experts participate on today's panel. The latest AOPA weather survey indicated a recurrent theme from the previous year's survey that many pilots were still not aware of the important guidance and resource that the AC provides. The AC includes information on developing and improving pre-flight briefing skills, interpreting weather, and identifying, identifying and mitigating risk. The initial WINGS course, How to Conduct Reflight pre-flight self-briefings for students and BFR pilots was released earlier this year and teaches pilots how to use and understand automated weather resources. My team and on behalf of the entire FAA safety team are so excited that the course has already reached more than 7,600 pilots. Our follow-on course, How to Conduct Pre-flight Self-Briefings for IFR Students and Pilots was released last month and has already reached 1,000 pilots. Both wing cor WINGS courses elaborate on the guidance in AC 91-92 with real-life scenarios. Flight Service is pleased to host this webinar because we believe that pre-flight self-briefing skills are just as important to pilot safety as their flying skills. Also, Flight Service is very excited to offer more resources to pilots to obtain weather information with the expansion of our weather program of our weather cameras from Alaska into Hawaii, as well as the contiguous United States. Thanks again to all the panelists. We look forward to hearing your insights on the benefits of pre-flight planning and the educational roadmap available in the AC. I'll now, I'll now turn it back to my team member, Frankie, as moderator. And as a side note, she's also a co-author of Latinas in Aviation, which was recently released. Back to you, Frankie. Thank you very much, Kathleen, and thank you for the endorsement there. Before I continue with our panelists, I would like to let everybody know that this uh, webinar will be available on YouTube after we finish today. We'll also post it on the FAA's media, social media, I'm sorry, the Facebook and LinkedIn will be available, so you'll be able to watch it later if that's needed. And now on to our panelists. Uh, first off is Cole Pope. Coke is the manager for the Weather Camera Program. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? I'm uh, Cole Pope, I'm the Weather Camera Program Manager. I've uh, been with the program for about 20 years and I uh, look forward to passing along a little bit of information to everybody today, thank you. Thank you, Cole. Next, I have Joe Foresto. Joe Foresto works for the General Aviation and Commercial Division for Flight Standards. Hello everyone, Joe Foresto. Well, I've been flying airplanes for over 52 years with the agency about 29 years. And uh, what we are proceeding on today is something that's very important for the safety of flight and standing by to help and assist. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next, I have James Williams. James is with also with Flight Standards and he works for the Safety Outreach Branch. Hello, uh, I've been working with the safety outreach program for about 15 years now. I'm a member of the National FAST team and uh, editor on the FAA safety briefing. We specialize in providing FAA resources to general aviation pilots. Thank you, James. And moving on to our next gen, next gen uh, folks, I have Dr. Ian Johnson. Dr. Ian Johnson is the human factors lead for the weather technology in the cockpit problem, which program, which is part of the aviation weather branch. Hi everyone, thank you, Frankie. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ian Johnson and I'm an engineering psychologist uh, with the FAA. Um, my role in the weather technology in the cockpit program, I'm the human factors lead and general aviation subject matter expert. I'm also a single and multi-engine pilot. 
and I have over 20 years experience in human factors engineer, engineering and uh, system safety for various cockpit displays and interface. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Next, I have one of my favorite people in the panel, Marilyn Person. Marilyn is a former FAA employee with Flight Standards, and she now is uh, working for Global Regulatory Affairs Specialist for Advanced Air Mobility, Electrical, Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing, and on crew Aircraft Systems for CAE, and she's the original author of the advisory circular we'll be discussing today. Thank you, Frankie. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Frankie said, I'm retired from the FAA, but while I was there, I served for 24 years. I'm the original author, along with many, many fabulous people who are on this panel, who are the team that put this together. I'm excited to present to you today. Uh, I'm an over 40-year uh, pilot, uh, been in aviation for quite a long time as a commercial pilot. I have an ATP for uh, single and multi-engine land and seaplane, a CFI uh, for single multi-instrument gliders, uh, gyroplanes, and I'm a Part 107 uh, pilot. I was one of the original authors also of the Part 107 regulations, and uh, my current position at CAE, I'm a Global Regulatory Specialist in Advanced Air Mobility, so uh, I'm very interested in weather. I continue to support uh, this group, and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn. Next, from Lighthouse Flight Service, Jeff Arnold. Jeff is the Director of Innovation at Lighthouse Flight Service. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Arnold. I'm an Oklahoma State graduate of uh, aviation science. And so uh, the key takeaway there is that the, the Cowboys are really the best team uh, I'm kidding. Um, no, I've been a flight instructor for close to 15 years, um, a little over 200 students uh, that I've interacted with in that time, and I've been very privileged to do so. Uh, previously served as program manager for two very large flight academies, one in Phoenix, one in North Texas, uh, taught to aviation meteorology and several ground schools at a local community college here in uh, North Texas as well. Uh, previously, I, I briefed pilots as a special uh, as a weather briefer for six years, and then I managed briefers for about three. And, and again, uh, a lot of what I do now in this role uh, is outreach. Uh, we go to uh, flight schools and pilot clubs and air shows, and we talk uh, to groups of pilots about uh, how they can uh, utilize us in the best ways to to maintain safety and and keep their flights uh, uh, going and in the air. Uh, the best ways. Um, to wrap this up, uh, I've got a wife, three kids, and a, and a worthless dog. Um, two of the kids are twins, and, and we will absolutely rent them out to destroy your home for a fee. Um, that's all from me. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for the offer. We'll pass, but thank you. Uh, we'll also welcome from AOPA, Jim McClay. Jim is the Director of Airspace, Air Traffic, and Security. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Frankie. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Jim McClay. I serve as uh, Director of Airspace, Air Traffic, and Security with AOPA. I've been here in this role for about two, a little over two years now. Um, I'm an instrument rated private pilot. Uh, I've got a background as an airline dispatcher and also a corporate aviation uh, scheduler. Uh, and I also spent about 13 years working in FAA's Air Traffic Control System Command Center dealing with air traffic issues. So, uh, very glad to be a part of this panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Next, I have Paul Freitecker. He is the president of NAFI. Paul? Uh, thank you so much. And thanks to all of our viewers who are participating. We uh, intend to bring a good program today. Um, my role here today is as president of NAFI, National Association of Flight Instructors. Um, our group is here to support um, the um, flight instructor community and to help provide uh, better and safer techniques for instruction. Um, I got a relatively late start in aviation, uh, but I have been a pilot for 34 years, flight instructor for 32 years. I had a 20 year career with the regional airline as their chief flight instructor and examiner. Uh, I uh, retired from the airline, but I have not retired from aviation. I stay involved in uh, part 61 instruction. Uh, I've done some part 135 flying and I still have a uh, um, 
connection to uh, other aspects of aviation, including uh, providing training curriculum for other airlines. And I'm a part-time contractor for the FAA, working on a project to standardize curriculum in Part 135 operations. Um, and additionally, I'm co-host of FAA Safety Briefing Live. So thanks for um, letting me be a part of this. Thank you, Paul. Next, from the NTSB, Don Ike. Don? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Don Ike. Uh, I have a degree in aeronautics from Member Riddle Aeronautical University and Florida State Meteorology and Meteorology, as well as pilot aircraft dispatcher certificates, weather observer certificates. I was formerly with a major airline as an instructor and then head of meteorology. And right now I am a B senior meteorologist at the NTSB, where I've been here for 25 years, dealing with over 500 accidents, and I've been in weather for about 40 years. So um, look to, to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And last but not least, John Cleaver. He is, excuse me, Cleaver, yes, from Ember Riddle, the PhD candidate for Applied Cognition and Training Science Lab. Paul, well, have John. Hello, everyone. My name is John Cleaver. As she mentioned, I am a doctoral candidate at Embryo Aeronautical University. I've been working uh, in the aviation and weather domain for about six years on products, um, projects related to the WIDIC program, looking at weather product interpretability and uh, pilots overall mental models of the weather before and during flight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for to all the panelists for joining us today to have this hopefully very productive conversation, and let's get right to it. I'm gonna start talking here with Marilyn. As we said before, she is one of the original authors of the advisory circular. And uh, Marilyn, tell me, what was the motivation for the FAA to write this AC? Uh, thanks, Frankie. The motivation wasn't the picture that you're seeing, but that could be part of the problem. Uh, the motivation originally was to clarify what is the pilot's responsibility? What does 91103 mean? What's pre-flight briefing? Um, another motivation was, as we know, uh, the briefers who answer telephones at flight service are not the only means of receiving weather information pre-flight briefing. Uh, with advances in technology and internet options, we needed to explain and demonstrate and show to people um, what, what they need to do, what is the pre-flight briefing, what's the responsibility. We also were prompted by stakeholders, AOPA, uh, the NTSB, Embry-Riddle and others to uh, help determine what tools are available and show people how to use those tools. Uh, the NTSB is very adamant about reducing the accidents and trying to eliminate uh, weather as one of the causal factors in these fatal accidents by helping people to understand what their responsibility is for a pre-flight briefing. Um, one of the concerns was compliance and enforcement. People were concerned about whether or not they would be held responsible or liable if they weren't receiving a pre-flight briefing that was recorded by flight service. And we tried to explain what the legal responsibility for this pre-flight briefing was and uh, how that affected them and how they would get a compliant briefing. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, Jeff, what was the motivation from your angle? Sure, and, and really to kind of mirror a lot of what Marilyn said, uh, from our perspective, we wanted to, to focus on clearing up a lot of those myths and misconceptions that had, again, been floating around the industry for the better part of a, a century, and, and that's, that's really not hyperbole. Um, but our, our primary objective is just to ensure that pilots are going online, obtaining a briefing, uh, regardless of the vendor, uh, and understanding two things. Uh, if the weather looks good in your judgment, um, there, there, we want you to trust that judgment. There's, there's really no need to go ahead and make a phone call uh, on, a, on a clear blue day. 
Uh, and if you do have questions, and you absolutely will after you've looked at the weather, and maybe that decision isn't so clear, uh, then absolutely uh, give flight service a call. Let's address those questions. And I think that you'll find that you'll have a much better experience after having generated that self-brief and, and gone through that process. Thank you, Jeff. So we know what the motivation was, but Marilyn and Joe, can you tell me what, what really is the AC? Let's start with, I, I will sort of skip over the name, it's the name of the webinar, but what is the AC itself? So Frankie, the AC itself is a, a comprehensive guide to pre-flight planning. It explains how to provide yourself with a pre-flight briefing, a self-briefing, if you will. And it, it gives information that's pretty comprehensive on a step-by-step -step approach for the pilot to use this circular, uh, how to do their pre-flight briefing uh, from beginning of thoughts of a flight to the actual uh, go to the airport and pre-flight your aircraft. Uh, it, it tells people how to gather and interpret the weather, and then how to understand what you've gathered and give you uh, a greater option for the resources that are available so that you understand more than just making a phone call. What can you do to avail yourself of every possible uh, circular internet option anything that's available, we tried to point that out and give you a list of all of the resources that are available. And then not only giving you a list, but instructing you as to how to use that list best for yourself. Uh, there's also a checklist in this AC that will help you to guide you through as a step-by-step -step approach so that you can check off the resources you've used and look at that checklist and determine what applies, what doesn't apply. And have I completed the checklist? Am I ready to go fly? Excellent, thank you. Uh, Joe, how about from your perspective, you're the current person of contact, the, the main contact for the AC, what do you think it is and what are the main takeaways that you take from it? Well, with the great work that Marilyn did at the onset, <clears throat> we have picked up on the data. We picked up on the risk assessment. I've developed a presentation called Leave Your Driving Habits in the Car. Uh, and the AC is going through update along with us working on doing some update on what a flight review will really be, aligning it more with the instrument proficiency check where there'll be specific um, areas you need to be uh, knowledgeable and skilled in uh, and on the AC update. We're looking to focus a lot more on risks and we're trying to promote a concept that the safest course between two points is not necessarily a straight line. So that said, we have the unexpected. Uh, being an adjunct professor at State University and working with a lot of the young students that are coming up, that the CFIs become a very major point in communicating to the upcoming students on what they need to know. Well, we've updated the CFI handbook with how number one, pilots can effectively can communicate with ATC, but we're working on developing more of a risk assessment piece. The unexpected, the engine gets sick, the pilot gets sick, weather mysteriously changes, something else goes on. Also, we have surface safety, mid-air collision issues coming up, and we're looking at ways to uh, make pilots more aware that, yeah, we got ADSB, yes, we have TCAS and all these other items, but your responsibility for clearance avoid uh, for collision avoidance is major. I just updated the 9048 AC, which deals with that, and uh, scanning outside is important. And we also have the issue with IFR operations, where with the a beacon on the tail and the strobe lights, you fly into a cloud at night, you very well could become uh, spatially disoriented because of the flashing light. You need to know some things have to be turned off. So the AC is going to provide more information on risks, what they could be, and you need to be prepared to handle the unexpected. When I flew in the airline, that was our major thing. Everybody said, okay, great, went through CRM. Now let's say what we think we're going to see, but guess what? 
something else may show up. So you need to have some skills, procedures, and uh, a plan B at all times. So the plan for this whole thing will be making pilots more aware of the safety elements in conducting a flight before you conduct a flight. Got it. Uh, Marilyn, do you have something to add to that? I could. I'd like to thank Joe. Uh, Joe and I have known each other for about 100 years or so, and uh, he's taken over and, and will be a great addition to helping promote this and revise it. But I'd like to also focus on what some of the takeaways are. We mentioned a little bit about the regulatory aspect and pilots um, asking the question of, is it a legal briefing? And I'd like to ensure everyone that we don't have a legal briefing, we have a way to be compliant. And we're hoping that this circular, this advisor circular tells you how to be compliant, not whether it's legal or it's not legal. That isn't the question, it's, is it compliant with the intent of the rule? Uh, we all know that weather is critical. Uh, I never plan a flight and go to the airport uh, first. I, I avail myself of all the weather before I even decide that I'm going to do the flight because I want to know if I can successfully complete the flight. So part of what I hope the takeaways are is that people will look at this and understand all those mysterious charts and symbols, whether they're using the National Weather Service or an independent provider, that they'll also understand that they need to set personal minimums and personal maximums. We talk about minimums, but I like to think about it as personal maximums. What, what weather is more than what I need to fly in or could fly in? So understand how to use those charts, the information, interpret it. And beyond that, don't collect information, collect what you need, what's appropriate for your flight. What is the altitude you plan at flying at? Are you flying at 5,000 feet or 20,000 feet? What's appropriate? What are your minimums? And also, what is the aircraft limitation? Can the aircraft fly into certain kinds of weather? So there are many, many concerns that I hope people will take away from this and that they'll be able to then answer, what is this compliant briefing and how do I do it? How do I interpret the myriad of information that I can pull off of weather uh, service providers. Thank you, Marilyn. And shifting away a little bit from the AC itself, uh, let's talk about the intent of the AC. Uh, James, what, why does the FAA consider self-briefings are actually a critical skill for pilots? Self-briefing has been a topic of conversation for a very long time as whether resources have gotten better and better for, for every pilot. Um, it's important to understand that self-briefing is a skill and like any skill, you can practice it and providing a framework for that's important. It enhances a pilot's ability to interpret weather and also to practice risk management, like some of our previous speakers were mentioning. The more you do it, the more familiar you get and more comfortable you get with resources, which is very important. And it also assists a pilot in making a critical no-go, go, no-go decision. And the, one of the most important things to remember is that it's important to be make that decision temporary in nature. You can always decide to stop. You can always decide to, you know, that your go became a no-go. And that's kind of an important thing to emphasize that, that in this process is that you should be constantly reevaluating your weather. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's very important. Sometimes people think about it as a one part of the of the process that once it's done, it's finished. But that's not true. We need to con to continuously reevaluate the weather, and this is why so many of the of the tools that are available nowadays in the cockpit facilitate that continuous evaluation of what's going on. And speaking of that, how, Jim, how, how do you see this from your perspective? Do you think that it is important for pilots to, to develop self-briefings as a critical skill? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we see this, especially uh, currently as, a, as such a critical skill is the the gradual transition that we have seen over the last number of years 
to pilots doing the, more of their own self briefings instead of calling flight service. You know, historically, it was it was common practice for a, a pilot to call a, a briefer, uh, you know, like Jeff, and and have them kind of walk them through a, a briefing and explain the weather and and the, the various things that they might uh, expect. Uh, a lot of that now is being replaced with pilots doing kind of a self serve. And so it becomes even more incumbent on the pilot to um, have those, those critical thinking skills, to um, have an understanding of the, the resources that they're looking at, and not, not just looking at a, a map to look at the map, but to actually understand what the map is telling them. Um, so uh, that, that's very important. The, the, the advent of the, the new technologies like uh, electronic flight bags, for flight, Garmin Pilot, et cetera, they're, they're great tools. Um, they, they do a lot for us. But it, it really, like I said, it, it puts a lot more of the onus on the pilot to be responsible for what they're looking at. And uh, I'll just add to uh, this was uh, something that Marilyn mentioned, the, the idea of a checklist. It's, uh, we think it's very, very important um, that pilots adopt a logical, structured process um, for, for doing their self-briefings to the point to where it becomes second nature. Um, and if you, if, if you need to get started with that, that's what flight instructors are there for, to help walk you through that and, and get into a comfortable routine. You touched up on two really important things is uh, talking about not only looking at the charts, but knowing what they mean. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. And also the checklist for what is worth. Flight service specialists also use a checklist. It's not one of those things that is out of memory there is a checklist you go through the process just to make sure that we don't miss anything when we're speaking to the pilots on the phone and there at the end you talked about the flight instructor so i'm going to tag up here paul for a moment what do you think is the the role of the cfi in this uh, development of this critical skill well it, it's our role is essential because we we sh if we're doing our job we should be setting the example and by setting the example, it means that, that we do it the right way and we work with our students to make sure they understand the right way. I mean, the, the primary reason that we're looking at this advisory circular and talking about this, I mean, it's a key element of driving safety and that's, of course, safety is what it's all about. But the uh, previous panelists have you know, talked about other things in terms of enhancing our risk management skills. I mean, the entire ACS is, uh, was created with a risk management as part of it. And in, in order to understand that, we have to perhaps change the way we teach a little bit and to do even scenario-based ground training. I mean, I, I always look at this as, you know, every time we get into an airplane and go from point A to point B, we're flying a scenario, but there's no reason that we can't uh, practice those scenarios um, in ground-based instruction. Um, the other part about this is it, it's up to the CFI to help uh, understand what the technology is. Um, I think it's similar to um, you have a new GPS in the, in the flight deck or in the, in the uh, cockpit, and you can maybe work your way through the menus um, haphazardly, but if you work with an instructor or take a class or look at an FAA webinar or a manufacturer's program, you'll get a much better understanding of how to use the technology. So, you know, working with your CFI, there's many ways to do this. Um, the, the slide is shown about the uh, VFR for self-briefing and IFR for self-briefing. These are wonderful parts of this and it will help our students prepare uh, for doing self-briefings. Um, we're really, again, trying to minimize risk and incorporating risk management and threat area management into how we um, fly our airplane. My most favorite part of the advisory circular is actually the last part, which is Appendix B, which is the checklist part. And the checklist part, um, if we are so used to using checklists on how we manage the flight, there's no reason we can't use a checklist to manage how we are um, managing our self-briefing tools. Um, and the gentleman who talked about go-no-go no go decisions, um, James Williams, um, he made a very important point about saying this needs to be a continuous process. And I, I usually frame that up by saying, 
Well, once you've made the go no go decision and you're going, now you need to do a start continue evaluation and keep that process going. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, the the flight instructors definitely are going to play a very important role in teaching the skills and actually developing during the training process. Once uh, you get past that stage, Jeff, what are some of the tools that that are available? How can pilots learn these skills? Sure, and and I want to add on to what uh, Paul just said uh, from personal experience. If if the flight instructor is weak in a particular subject, then the the student is going to be weak in that subject as well, and, and we we see that a lot uh, where uh, that that problem just snowballs. Uh, that that student will go progress through their training, and then they'll become an instructor and and they were weak in weather. And unless they've taken that initiative to fix that problem, their, their students down the line are going to be weak in weather as well. And so we just see that uh, that perpetuate. And, and so we want to put a stop to it somewhere, right? Uh, it, but the biggest thing for flight instructors is to just insist on consistency with your students. Uh, one skipped pre-flight briefing uh, sets a precedent uh, that says, hey, this is okay. Um, but to, to answer the question uh, uh, of uh, what can we do to uh, help pilots learn these skills of self-briefing? I, I want to provide a little bit of context to this answer first. Uh, in, in my experience, comfort and familiarity have kind of been the bedrocks of, of education. Um, and when we talk about skills or what someone's learned, what we're really asking them is how familiar and comfortable with this are you? And so a significant portion of pilots that we've spoken to in person, uh, 85 to 90 percent, again, I haven't documented this, this has been in person, they've indicated to us that they are uncomfortable with weather or interpreting weather products. Uh, and we see that as a huge problem, uh, especially when pilots are raising their hands and saying, hey, we are admitting we feel uncomfortable with this stuff. Uh, that's something that we, we certainly want to uh, address. Um, and, and one thing that we, we say to pilots at, uh, at events and shows and presentations, wouldn't it be great if pilots had the same comfort with weather and products that they have uh, with the car that they drive every day to work? Uh, how did they get to that level of, of comfort and familiarity? Uh, day in and day out interaction. Uh, and, and so to really drive that uh, point home, we're really recommending that pilots should start by reading the AC and I really want to compliment Marilyn uh, because uh, one of the things that I've been telling pilots is this is a very, this isn't your typical AC. You say you say advisory circular to a lot of pilots and, and they just kind of turn their ears off, right? Like my kids. Um, I, and, and that's a joke, but uh, this is this is a very easy read. It's a very user friendly document. It's about 20 pages. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's very friendly. It's pilot friendly. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, but anyway, uh, so again, read the AC. Uh, there's a checklist in the back. Um, the the slide that we have in front of you, the VFR and IFR wings course. I, uh, courses. I can't say enough uh, great things about these courses. These are. Uh, I've been in education a while, and these are some of the best educational content courses I've ever seen put together. Uh, scenario based training. They're comprehensive. They're thorough. Uh, take the time to to to. To, to go through them. Uh, you'll, you'll really enjoy it. Um, but try not to, to view these things and, and, and learning weather and, and these skills as work to complete or tasks to be accomplished. Uh, because if you're anything like me, they'll be procrastinated until they just have to be done, right? Uh, I, I try to view them uh, meant or trick myself uh, to uh, just view it as something that I haven't learned yet. So... And Paul, I, you have a follow-up for this? Well, I certainly appreciate um, uh, Jeff's comments about this. And the other part of this is, you know, a question that comes up sometimes is, is when do you introduce this to, our, to the pilot group? And realistically, this should be taught in the initial pilot training, but let's make sure that we're also using any flight review or any upgrade certificate as an opportunity to continue this. Um, you, if you have a 
you know, if, if your business is flight instructing and you have a list of your students or potential students continually mailing out invitations to webinars and seminars about this information will help keep people engaged. And um, it's important for us to be seen as a resource, not just when we're doing face to face teaching, but all of the time. Absolutely. Thank you. Marilyn, you have something too? I'd like to just add on a little bit to what uh, we already have been hearing from everyone else and the kind words, uh, thank you for the AC. I'm not totally responsible for this. I, I take uh, credit with a team. And this team was made up of all kinds of people, pilots and non-pilots. Uh, we think this AC is a very valuable resource for a student pilot and um, a pilot, maybe not a commercial pilot, but I'd also like to suggest that uh, this could be a refresher for a CFI. Many CFIs haven't taught for years. Perhaps they're only teaching part-time. This could be a great refresher for the CFI, for that individual to help teach their students. And um, I'd like to point out something that I learned at the FAA that the most failed area in any written test, whether you're taking uh, a knowledge test for the private pilot rating all the way through to an ATP, the most failed area is the weather. In fact, you could conceivably fail every weather question uh, and still pass your test with that 70%. Of course, you'd have to do pretty well on the other areas, but uh, that doesn't speak well for what we teach uh, regarding weather or the ability for us to transfer the knowledge about weather. It's important, uh, as we just heard, that people become comfortable planning the flight and using weather and being familiar with what the charts say and how does it uh, pertain to their flight. What's important rather than saying, I've, I've looked at the charts and I've read them, but does that particular chart have meaning for your flight. So um, I'd encourage CFIs to look at this AC, look at it with your student. You can learn just as much as the student can. And Dr. Johnson, you have something to add to this as well? Yes, thanks, Frankie. Um, everything that all the, the panelists before me, I agree with. Um, one of the things I have to say, though, and this is based on some of the research that we have seen, um, pilots are not very comfortable with weather and instructors are not very comfortable teaching weather. So it's, it's one of these things you can't teach what you don't know. And so um, I think I'm, maybe it's the way weather is being taught to pilots. Uh, you know, I, when I did my um, training, I, I went to Embry-Riddle. And the courses that I did in meteorology, um, it was more geared for meteorologists. So to me, it was not taught the way a pilot needs to, how the pilot actually use the weather and operation environment. So I think that's something we need to look at. And even some of the weather products that are, that are out there today, maybe we need to go back and look at those products to see how intuitive those products are. Um, maybe that may help pilots in how to interpret information a little better. Thanks. Thank you. And I wanted to add something. Flight service specialists also participated in the development of the AC. So there is a perspective on how to follow the checklist and the things that are most important during a self-briefing. And in that note, um, I'm hearing here that knowing that self-briefings are important and knowing how to conduct the briefing itself. The self-briefing are two very different things. So, Joe, what do you think are some of the key elements to a good self-briefing? Okay, the elements of a good briefing. Well, you have to start off with the unanticipated event. We'll go in, we can check our weather, and you can get the interpreted uh, weather rather than read it the way it's put out for an aviation weather uh, forecast. Uh, or current weather. But if you do not sit back and think about what could occur, what is out there waiting for me that I'm not thinking about? Because once you are presented with an unanticipated event, you are now distracted from other and primary duties. And this is where the plan B and C has to come in. 
But overall, a key element is one, do you really have to go? And number two, does it fall within my personal minimums? Because it's uh, 3,005 doesn't mean, oh yeah, I can go. No, you may need, because of your experience and recent experience, typical GA pilots are in the 40 to 50 hours a year. Uh, that's not enough. And that's, that's just because there's just too much going on today with all the technology. I do a lot of flight instruction and then we're all plugging in their, their iPads and their phones and all kinds of stuff are going on. And um, the issue is uh, they become very dependent upon other elements rather than having to depend on themselves once they get into a situation. And once you're in that situation, just like hand-to-hand -hand combat and numb, we had to do what we had to do to protect ourselves and our, and our uh, crew members. The other side of it is identify what could happen we don't know what could happen. Anything can happen. Thing is, you need to be prepared through skill, knowledge, and proficiency. And that's a key point for the instructors to nail down. And we have all these, this AC focuses on areas of information. And now we have to get to us. The latent failure in aviation is us, the human being. And we get ourselves squared away to say, you know what? We're not perfect. Let's go one step beyond. Estimating in-flight visibility is an important piece. When you have to start stepping down just to ma maintain ground contact, if you're just a VFR pilot and you can't go ahead and get all ATC and get yourself an IFR clearance en route, when is low too low? So those are elements that the FAST team had put out when, when I, before I was a FAST team manager, was called the uh, accident, prevent accident Prevention Organization. And they put out a flyer. You can look it up online. You go to fa.gov, estimating in-flight visibility. You can see it. But you put this whole thing together, you have to analyze what you are going to in what you're going to encounter. You're going to an airport. You do not know what's going on at that airport unless you check the chart supplement or make a phone call. How much military operation? How many heavy jets? How about jet blast? A lot of training going on. This whole thing, and how about mistaken, mistaking the airport you're heading for by some other airport? We've had those situations, landing at wrong, uh, the wrong airports. So overall, it's a constant, where could I go wrong? Where could I go wrong? Where could I go wrong? And you got to fill in the gaps. I mean, this is not an easy task. And this AC is guidance to keep the lights on so you can see exactly where you're going. If you can't get the answer, Take the bus. That's what I'm going to go say, period. Thank you, Joe. And uh, Jeff, from the briefer's perspective, what, what do you think are the key elements to a good self-briefing? Sure. So I want to talk about the slide in front of you, and, and this is in uh, the WINGS courses as well. Uh, but to, to really break this down, what you're looking at is where are we going? What's going on? Are there any risks and are those risk deal breakers? And once we've taken a look at all of that, uh, we say, okay, do we have a go or no go decision? And, and once we have a tentative decision and let's, for the purposes of this example, say that we've decided to go. Now we wanna identify any criteria that could potentially turn that go decision into a no go decision. So, uh, and, and I think it was James that said before, uh, just because you've decided to go, that doesn't mean that this is, that's a permanent decision. Uh, that that decision can change, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that pilots are are thinking about that, that they're following a an established process. Uh, they're considering all available weather information. Uh, and again, we strongly advise pilots use a weather log. Uh, lots of pilots report to me personally, uh, only glancing at a radar and per pulling uh, METARs and TAFs for the route of flight. Um, that's insufficient. Uh, that that just won't work. Uh, there, there's a lot more going on, right? Um, we also recommend strongly uh, that pilots, uh, and again, you've heard it countless times already since we've logged on, right? That pilots use a checklist uh, so that we don't miss anything. Um, uh, there's a reason why the 121 and 135 operators have better safety records than GA, and I promise I'm not throwing rocks. Uh, they just have very strict operating requirements that they're required to stick to, uh, and the checklists are no different. 
Uh, the one time that you forget could potentially be one time too many. Uh, when we take a look at the uh, the slide that, that Frankie pulled up for us, uh, so you have a, a, this is very similar to what uh, the flight service specialists use um, whenever they whenever you call in and get a briefing, right? It's got your briefing laid out in a very logical format uh, on the very far left, the checklist items uh, in the middle, it shows where you got the source. So if you go looking for it again, you can find it again, which uh, is a common problem. Uh, and then any notes um, that you may have. Uh, again, you may need to reference it later or during the flight. Um, it, moving forward, uh, again, during your pre-flight, uh, you, you, we start talking about um, situational awareness and time-based awareness for your weather. Uh, and I think that's figure seven. Uh, one of the things that we offer at, at flight service, uh, you're looking at uh, on the left, the ICAO flight plan mask, uh, but the red circle that you see there is an evaluate departure tool. And when you click on that, uh, the, the intent here was to aid the go, no-go decision-making process. And so what this does is it gives you a, a profile view of your flight uh, in any adverse conditions, anything that's going to affect your decision to make that flight uh, for various time periods so that you say, hey, 1245 doesn't look like a great time to leave. Uh, let's jump forward at, at, at an hour at a time. Uh, and see if there's a better time to depart. Um, and just to kind of wrap this up, uh, we want to, I'll let Ian speak to this specific chart, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, you guys are planning for all phases of flight. Uh, and again, we do cover that process in depth with the WINGS courses. Uh, and uh, just, just remember a partially planned flight is one that has a question mark at the end. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ian, you have uh, some words regarding this chart, some comments regarding some of the pressures that are outside of the ones that Jeff mentioned? Yes, thanks, um, Jeff, for, for those comments. Um, so one, one of the things that we've seen and, and what pilots need to know, um, there's a lot of tools out there to help the pilots. And, you know, I take advantage of them. Um, I try to attend every safety seminar that comes in my area, because, you know, the more knowledge you have, the better off you are. And these are just a collage of um, tools that I pulled from the, um, the, F, the, the safety risk management um, handbook that is published by the FAA. It's uh, FAH8083-2. And here you see you have the, the PAVE personal minimum checklist and basically looks at the pilot, the aircraft, the environment and external pressures. I wanna talk a little bit about external pressures. So external pressures could be either you're running late or you know your passenger is pushing you, hey, we gotta get there. At the end of the day, you need to, let, you need to know that you're the pilot in command and you have to make that decision. And a lot of pilots get sucked into uh, external pressures. Um, if you're running late, then you need to, um, and you check the weather before, then you need to go back and check to see if there are any updates. Then you have, you know, I'm, I'm safe uh, checklist. You know, are you safe to fly? Are you stressed? Did you just get off of work? You know, all these things you need to take into consideration. And then I think that the, the best mitigating strategy is the one here uh, where it says mitigating the risk. You know, wait until the weather is VFR if you're, if you're, if you're not an IFR pilot. Or maybe if you have a friend who's IFR rate, who's IFR current and proficient, because he could be current but not proficient, maybe you can take him along or her along, or just cancel the flight or consider driving. So all these tools are available, and I would, um, you know, encourage you guys to um, look at these tools and and do everything before you leave the ground. Don't wait until you get into the airplane and try to figure it out. That's too late because while you're trying to figure it out, the airplane is moving. So that's um, my advice to you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, Paul, you have something to add to this? Yeah, this, this is such a good conversation because it's bringing up so many uh, topics that are important and especially for the flight instructor. I think I heard Marilyn address this early in her comments, and it's and it's so true that we we have to 
make sure that people are understanding the technology and just just like wet or just like technology in the flight deck uh, weather technology is different depending on the provider so it's up to the instructor to make sure that he or she is teaching the differences in how the information is presented it could be something as simple as uh, the codes that are used it might be something as simple as the colors that are used on a, on a radar display so our goal is to really make sure that we're applying this to the situation and taking it a step farther to correlate to how we're teaching other topics. For example, out of a, um, you know, out of a sort of a guided briefing with our students, um, we might use it as an opportunity to talk about performance issues related to density altitude, or on the other side of it, um, start talking about icing conditions in flight and what that means for the particular operation. So we can use these tools and techniques as we're learning about weather to also learn about other subjects that are important for the for the pilot. Um, and the other part, I, we, we talk a lot about personal minimums, and I, I'm a firm believer that we should establish personal minimums. However, they also need to be applied to the situation. The personal minimums you set for yourself, maybe today, um, maybe they would change in three months from now if you're if you haven't flown in a while or you haven't flown an IFR flight. So personal minimums are a great place to start, but don't be afraid to adjust them based on the situation and your own self-assessment. Thank you, Paul. And you touched a little bit uh, just now and a little bit earlier on the role of the flight instructor for teaching self-briefings, but how do you think instructors can prepare to teach the self-briefings? Um, well, first, um, as, as Dr. Johnson said, uh, we have to make sure the flight instructors are familiar with this material. So um, we need to dig in deep into, the, into this advisory circular, um, look at the briefing tools and the technology that are available. And then, um, as we talked about before, go ahead and take, you know, take the WINGS courses that are available for both VFR and IFR. Um, remember that there is an instructor companion document that's available, which is also very helpful. And um, as I said before, I, I think being, uh, being willing to uh, do scenario-based training, not just for a flight, but also for ground-based training is an excellent way to help an instructor transfer this information to our students. Thank you so much. That uh, companion document, uh, the team worked really hard to put it together, to be very thorough, to make sure that we hit all the important points to try to make it as useful as possible. And moving, moving a little bit along with some of our other panelists we haven't heard from, I'm going to ask Don to come on camera now. Don, what does the NTSB think about self-briefings? Well, with all the uh, the various forms of information that's out there, uh, the graphic uh, presentations are the most effective. So getting a good idea of what's out there is critical so you know where the, the weather is. If we look at overall weather accidents by themselves, I mean, I mean total accidents, almost one in five accidents, that we have or one in four are have a weather related uh, factor. Matter of fact, if you look at the big red here in this uh, pie chart, over half the weather related accidents are due to low ceilings and visibility or typically the uh, inattentional flight into instrument meteorological conditions, IMC. And one of the studies that we did previously, we found that almost 40% of these accidents a pilot did not receive an adequate weather briefing, i.e. he was missing data, or maybe just looked at a METAR and TAP for the destination and departure, nothing in between, uh, or didn't look at the in-flight advisories, pilot reports. So some critical piece of information wasn't looked at, or they didn't get any briefing at all. And that to us is, is unacceptable. Now, we recommended uh, self-briefings in uh, the push for this AC just to help reduce that number of accidents that we have. Weather-related accidents, 
are almost always fatal. They have the highest fatality rate, and we want to see that reduced. And just to throw this to you, with accidents that occur in instrument meteorological conditions, they only average 2 to 4% of our total accidents, but they account for over 18% of the fatalities. So again, we want to reduce those accidents. We want to get you to your destination, home safe, and to continue with your careers in weather and self-briefing is critical. Thank you, Don. Since, since we know that the FAA endorses the self-briefings and the NTSB also thinks it's a good idea, particularly to reduce the amount of accidents and especially the fatalities that we have out there. This question, it's, it's coming up a lot in, in many of the chats that we have with pilots. I know it's been asked to, Jeff at Lidos has been asked at flight standards. But I would like to talk to both Don and Marilyn about what is the important, uh, is it important to record the briefing? Um, do they have to be recorded? And can pilots use just graphical weather and graphical charts to, to self-brief? And generally speaking, those graphical tools do not have a recording feature. So is it really that important? Well, it's not, not required that you go through a flight service station or a Lidos or one of the, the major vendors, but it does help in our reconstruction of the events to know that you received a briefing or, or obtained one and what you, what you looked at. Because majority of the time when we're looking at accidents, we're looking at the pilot, the controller, um, the aircraft, and the environment. And Hey, I don't know if you realize this, the weather service is not 100% accurate all the time. Uh, right offhand, I would say 60% of our cases, the weather was properly forecasted that they received. The other 20%, we see um, that weather was better than forecasted. So they were forecasting IFR conditions and VFR conditions were reported. But the other 20% of that is weather was not properly forecast, it was forecast to be a VFR, all of a sudden you have, you have IMC. So we look at briefings to say, hey, what would the pilot have known? Could he have avoided the scenario? Uh, did he have a good out? Were the proper procedures, advisories issued? So we kind of quality control. We look at uh, the weather service, air travel controls, reaction to it the pilot's uh, availability of that information and try to get a big picture. Marilyn, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add. You covered the why should you have uh, a recording and, and it's valuable information that the NTSB needs to help uh, keep pilots safe, develop programs to enhance the safety aspect. The most asked question I get now and even early on in the writing of this was, does it need to be recorded? Because will it be legal if it's not recorded? And what I'd like for pilots to understand is that the legality is not the key here. It's uh, the pre-flight briefing. Whether it's recorded or not, the important takeaway should be that you are using your checklist, just like we're required to have a checklist in the aircraft or we're required to use the checklist in the aircraft, if you take the checklist that is in this AC and you fill it out, you'll have a recording of what you've done. You'll be able to look at what might have been missing. Maybe you misinterpreted something, but it will give you a step-by-step, -step, again, process to ensure that you've covered everything. So if, it's, if you haven't had a recorded briefing, you have some record and maybe you can share that record or that record might be shared with others to compare it to what you might have been do doing better. Look at it with your CFI. The CFI may tell you that uh, one area that you focused on, maybe it wasn't quite correct. Uh, so it is important to have a recording or a record, some sort of a record of what you've done so that you can mitigate the risk and that you understand what your limits are. Your limits may change, we've heard that before. Your limits may change with experience. A low time pilot 
may have limits. Uh, when I was an early learning pilot, I set limits for myself, crosswind limits, uh, turbulence, cloud height, that sort of thing. But as I gained experience and time went on, I changed those limits. Again, if you have some sort of a documentation and you've written down what your personal limits are, and now you document the weather and those don't agree, then it's time to decide that you shouldn't be flying. And another critical area, if you have a question, if you say, well, you know, I really wonder if I should go, maybe I should, well, I think I could, all of those questions should lead to, I'm not going today, that you'll do what Joe has said, take the bus or drive the car or go tomorrow or send your apologies. But it's not critical to go if the weather is questionable because we don't want you to be that person in the first slide that we showed you. Um, I think we should not focus so much on the regulatory requirements of the recording, but what the recording provides, both for the NTSB and for you and for your instructor as a learning tool as well. Uh, also, if you're uh, looking at how to reinforce your personal limits, this data that you collect, that you put down, will help you. Uh, it, will it will teach you. And uh, one thing I, I learned so much doing this AC, uh, I experienced uh, what the briefers tell you and, and what flight service shares and how they interpret weather and what all of the charts mean. So even for me, this was a learning experience after more than 40 years of flying. So it's important to keep records document. Um, some of the tools that you'll use uh, for flight or some of the other uh, areas that you can look at, uh, the internet has options, the National Weather Service, some of those do have a means to record the fact that you've been on that site and what you've looked at. Um, that could help the NTSB, I'm sure, but it, it's also important to reinforce what did I do? And the next time, what can I do better? Well, yeah. likely if they had looked at it, I wouldn't be getting involved. <laughs> and Marilyn and Don, you both brought up really important points. Uh, and one thing to note that a record and a recording are not necessarily the same thing. And just the fact that you call flight service and you have a recording, if you went through your checklist and were not paying attention to the flight service specialist and just went, oh, all good, while the flight service specialist told you things were not good, then you, you don't have matching documentation, right? So it's very important that you use that checklist and that you're actually paying attention, even if you were calling flight service or even if you were in the LIDOS website doing your, your pre-flight briefing, if you have a manual uh documentation that you're actually going through all the elements and looking at everything carefully, it's even more beneficial, not just for investigation purposes, but for your own pers personal benefits. You know you're going through all the steps, you know you're not going to miss anything. And on that note, we're going to move on to the next topic. Um, let's see here, Joe. What is a good list of resources for self briefings uh, to obtain weather and aeronautical information? And where can folks get this? Joe, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. Well, we may have lost Joe there. Um, Jeff, uh, what about you? Do you have any idea where we can get this information? Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, so this is a great chart uh, with a lot of great resources on it uh, for you, but uh, the AC provides an excellent list and, and that's a lot of what you're looking at here, both WINGS courses as well. Uh, that's on the next figure. Uh, the IFR course will also show you how to use several government provided resources to collect uh, the weather for your checklist items. Uh, one thing that really helped me personally when I was writing lesson plans for meteorology was to uh, take the old aviation weather handbook. I think it's it's the one, I'm not sure of the document number. It's the one that was written in 1975. I'm sure you all, you're all familiar with it. Uh, 
but it's an excellent book and, and to go through their line item through line item uh, or excuse me sentence through sentence it's it's very well written and it's still very relevant and um uh, that helped me a lot uh, personally but uh, again, uh, just uh, just getting in there and, and getting your hands in it uh, is the most important thing. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's see, Jim, does AOPA have any additional resources for self-briefings? Well, yeah, uh, just uh, to pick up where, where Jeff left off there, this this is a pretty comprehensive list right here of the various resources that are out there. Certainly, a, uh, AOPA has our own iFlight Planner uh, product that c contains an awful lot of the, the information you would want. And then, of course, you know, the, the elephant in the room, if you would, uh, you know, we've got you've got the third party tools like ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot that, that an enormous number of pilots use. Again, they they. Uh, provide a lot of the resources uh, that are that are here as well, or the or our equivalent. Um, you know, one other thing that I just wanted to mention, you know, kind of right along with that is just the important importance. And this was mentioned earlier of uh, taking a big picture look at at, uh, at various information and preparing for your flight. Um, and we've been talking an awful lot about weather today, and obviously weather is a huge part of the pre-flight process. But remember, we've got things like airspace considerations, we've got NOTAMs that need to be looked at, and, and don't get me started on <laughs> the importance of NOTAMs. Uh, the, the number of TFR busts that we uh, regularly see will speak to that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that need to be looked at just beyond the weather. So I, that's, I'll just throw that in, out there as well. You know, it's a good idea in the process of all of this, when you're done with your briefing, take a step back and just big picture, you know, ask yourself, is there anything else that I should be thinking about here that's not part of my normal checklist? So I'll just add that in there. Thanks, Jim. Ian, has your uh, research come up with a different a different set of resources that you may uh, be able to to recommend? Uh, actually, no, Frankie. Um, this is a comprehensive list here. Um, but one thing I must say is that if pilots decide to use any of these resources or from this list, they need to ensure that it does have the information that they need for their flight. And, um, you know, many pilots are probably comfortable using certain websites because those websites are very user friendly. Um, some websites may be very difficult to navigate and, and trying to bring all the information together to have that mental model um, before you actually launch the flight may be very difficult. So it's it's an individual on an individual basis. I think each pilot has to know what they're comfortable using, but the information that they're using should be um should they should consider that information how it affects their flight so it's an individual basis but i i, I also agree with the rest of the panelists that you know I, i'm a big fan of practice 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 uh, and eventually you'll get it right and so when when you actually go out there and you start flying it and, and if something pops up at least you you know the handbook because like i said the last place you want to try to figure it out is in the cockpit Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Marilyn, do you know if the source of weather vary based on the type of operation that will be performed? Oh, yes. I think um, Ian just mentioned that that in his comments that uh, the source of weather will vary. You know, you, not all of these resources are appropriate for the flight that you might be doing. So you have to determine which source of weather is going to apply if you're flying low level or or a higher level. Maybe your flight is local in nature. Maybe you're going a long distance with several stops along the way for fuel. Uh, so you need to determine which source of weather information is most appropriate for the flight that you're doing and the capability of the aircraft that you're flying. Um, I'd also like to just offer that there are many third party resources that are not listed here. Uh, the government doesn't um, promote third party resources. Uh, so we did not publish those that you might be using. That's not to say that there's a problem with those resources, but I want people to understand that the third party resources take their weather from the National Weather Service. And in some cases, they may represent it a little bit differently. Perhaps the colors are not the same. So be careful from chart to chart, resource to resource.
that you understand what you're looking at and that you interpret it properly. What might be green on one chart might be red on another chart. So I just want to offer that as a caution to people when they're using some of their favorite resources for weather. So also I want to encourage pilots to help other pilots file a PIREP, a pilot report. You don't have to only file a PIREP when the weather's bad. Perhaps you want to file a report telling a fellow pilot that the weather is in fact absolutely wonderful for the flight that you're taking. And it might encourage someone who questioned whether or not the weather was appropriate. Well, the weather is appropriate for your flight, but you're helping your fellow pilot. You're also helping uh, the briefers by giving them the information as you're flying. And it doesn't really matter if you know how to fill out a PIREP form, just uh, offer some information to the briefer or to whoever you're talking to along your route of flight and help each other as you're flying. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Dr. Johnson, you have something to add here? Yes, um, it seems like Marilyn uh, picks, picked my brain, I guess, <laughs> based on some of the things that she just said. I, I think one, one something that's also important to you, a, a pilot needs to know his or her capabilities and limitations, right? Similar to your the capabilities and limitations of your aircraft. And, you know, if you know you're not capable because, you know, you don't have a good handle in the weather, then you need to wait it out or, or maybe take someone along with you who is pretty much proficient in weather. Because, like I, I, I keep saying, the last place to try to learn weather is when you're in the cockpit. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I have your attention. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit, maybe with uh, John, about some of the research that we have done on self briefings and what are the common traps that you have found out and what can the pilots do to mitigate this, uh, this traps? Okay, so um, the weather technology in the cockpit has done uh, a lot of research um, looking at how pilots interpret weather information um, and Brita Arnautica University, um, John will talk to that in a few minutes. Um, we did a study, they did a study for us funded by the FAA, and here are some of the, the, the results that they, they found. Pilots, you know, struggle to depict weather along their route. What we found out is that pilots are, when they do their pre-flight planning, they're planning from the departure point to the destination. But basically, they're not doing a holistic plan. A holistic plan includes the entire route of flight. So what happens when they get in up in the air and the weather changes because weather is very dynamic, they don't have a way out. Um, and, and the second bullet there, they said it held incorrect weather expectations for most of the, the, the route of flight and destination airport. Um, many of them don't know how to access the, the various weather products and basically, you know, paint, get that mental model of basically, you know, what the flight is going to be like before you even leave the ground. Um, so we 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 we're still going through that research. John John is a part of that um, research team, and I'm let I'm I'm going to let him um, chime in, um, maybe talk about some of the preliminary results that we've seen so far. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and building off what Ian said about. Uh, having knowledge of the departure and the arrival, but not having uh, knowledge about the in route that we found that it, it extends to the general flight area. They have even less understanding of what's going on just outside of the flight route. This can be incredibly important, in special, especially if they're doing a cross-country flight, because what might uh, be on the periphery that might not impact immediately if they get delayed for some reason, the weather, which is variable, speeds up. They need to know what systems could be on the horizon and if weather comes into their area, where should they divert and how can they properly respond to the weather so that they're not getting themselves into situations where they're flying further into systems. Um, some of the other problems that we found is a general overall lack of aviation weather knowledge. We've created uh, various weather interpretation tests and found regardless of whether they're student pilots or commercial instrument 
they're all below that 70% threshold that you would expect them to, to know in order to pass their initial qualification tests. Um, some of the other things that we found is that they struggle with particular types of products. So uh, current products where you're looking at what the weather is like at the time of your departure, uh, that's a lot easier to interpret uh, when you're starting to look at forecast products that you have to project out into the future, uh, they tend to struggle more with those. Also products that involve coded information, that's another barrier that you have to first decode the information and then apply that to your flight. So that just adds a little bit more difficulty. Also, uh, some of the overall design of the weather products can have uh, can cause increased difficulty. As has been mentioned before, pilots gain weather knowledge uh, through sites like AWC or third party uh, sites. However, the exact representation of the weather products might vary depending on which site you're at. This can include uh, different colors being used or slightly different graphics, uh, and that can foster more confusion for pilots, especially if they're moving between one uh, source and another. So those are some of the things that we have found. And if I may just add to what John said, um, so what we're doing in weather technology in the cockpit, we're looking at gaps in weather information and bring pilots in, we um, develop scenarios. I fly them as a pilot myself, I bring in other pilots to fly them. And then we, ask pilot, we bring in pilots as participants to actually fly the scenario and then we collect data. And basically what we found out that a lot of pilots when they're flying, for instance, you know, using a weather display depicting the weather information, you have these um, basically symbols that indicate whether your airport is VFR, IFR, or marginal VFR. We found that when the airports change conditions, many pilots were not aware of the change. So we're trying to find various ways to communicate that, um, you know, either by using a visual channel as well as the auditory channel. So they'll hear it, they'll see it, and that will draw their attention to it. So that's one of the studies that we plan to do this year. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Don, has the NTSB done any research on this? Um, we have looked at it, but again, we're uh, still kind of going through numbers and um, trying to see how the best, best ways to handle it. Thank you. And let's see, let's move on to something else here. Jeff, what do you think is a safe transition to self briefings? Sure. And we want to emphasize that when pilots do start to transition to self briefings, we we want to caution pilots not to jump feet first into a cold turkey transition, right? Um, the last thing anyone on this panel wants is for someone to just take a look at the weather uh, independently as an island and then go out and, and something happen. Um, we want this to be a gradual process. Uh, and, and so uh, looking at the, at the transition strategy that you see before you, uh, this is a very fair, logical uh, strategy. Uh, we want you to continue to use that checklist um, and, and identify those risks, uh, uh, then make your go, no-go decision. And again, that's never a permanent decision. Uh, consult with your CFI. And, and again, if you're out of that training environment, uh, something that uh, I've, I forgot to bring up earlier, it, it's vitally important that pilots be a part of some kind of a community, be it in person or online. Um, we go back to that kind of lone wolf or, or living on an island uh, pilot. Um, it, it's, it's very important uh, to, to be able to talk to other pilots and, and bounce ideas. Um, but, uh, again, compare your, your, your decision, uh, or your assessment with your CFI, uh, see if they've come to the same conclusion, uh, if needed, again, uh, a lot of pilots that we talk to these days, uh, we say, you know, why do you call flight service? Uh, not because we, we want them to stop calling, but because we want to make sure that we're still providing the best service to them. And a lot of pilots are telling us nowadays that they're calling to uh, either validate their decision or get a second opinion on the decision that they've already made. And we think that's fantastic. 
Um, so that, that's another resource available to you. And uh, when you start seeing your decisions and your assessments are becoming more consistent with your CFI and with your briefers, uh, you're starting to get on the right track. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot like preparing for your knowledge test. Uh, I'm sure your instructors have said, you know, bring me, you know, f- uh, five 90% uh, passing scores and I'll, I'll uh, you know, give you an endorsement or whatever they used to do, right? Uh, this, the same principle here. It's going to take a lot more than five times. Uh, but uh, once you start to get confident and once you start to get comfortable, uh, you'll start. You'll know when you're ready uh, to to start doing this on your own. And one of the things that we've really started recommending to pilots, especially at air shows, um, we've recommended just uh, going back to that familiarity aspect. Uh, take a look at at the weather every day, whether you're flying or not, um, and. Uh, save a, a, a real quick 50 nautical mile cross country that you're familiar with on your profile, pull it up every morning. And if, again, if you miss a day, who cares, pick it up again tomorrow. Uh, but what you're doing, it, you're investing five minutes of your time every day in weather. And you would be shocked at how much that investment will pay dividends at the end of a year. Just glancing at the weather for five minutes a day, it's exposure, it's day-to-day interaction that we talked about before. Um, and that le- your level of comfort will rise exponentially. Um, uh, so those are some of the, the tools and strategies that we, that we recommend. And you'll also get used to making that go, no-go uh, decision or that call. And uh, so when you, when you do find yourself in, uh, in that position with passengers and with weather, uh, it, it won't be an alien scenario to you anymore. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Do you have, uh, Ian, do you have any any further recommendations on this? Thanks, Frankie. Yes. Um, I mean, Jeff nailed it. But um, what I want to add to that is that, you know, I, I would ask the flight instructors who are on this um, call right now, basically every day that you fly with your students, ask them to plan a flight or basically look at the weather. And basically what you're doing there, you're training them. And, and you can also know areas that they're weakened. And then you can target those areas where they're weakened. So don't just, you know, have them plan a flight when they're just going on a cross country. I mean, most of the flights are local. But just ask them, hey, we're going to fly today. Um, I, want you guys, I want you to look at the weather and you bring it to me and explain to me what it is. And it helps, it helps the student. I mean, it helps the student immensely. And then you're, you, you as a flight instructor, you know, when you do solo that student, at least you know, hey, th- this, this individual knows the weather, so I don't have to worry about anything. So I, I think that's a good thing for flight instructors. But there again, we go back to, you know, if you don't know the weather, you can't teach the weather. So that's my two pennies. Thank you. Thank you. And con- continuing on this path, a question that has come up on the Q&A a couple of times, not a question, more of a comment. I saw something about needing a checklist of checklists and information overload. Uh, Ian, do, do you think that someone can have too much technology in the cockpit and how can they effectively use it? Well, frankly, the answer, the answer is a big yes, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, um, if you're going to use technology, you need to be cognizant of the ca- capabilities and limitations of that technology. Most of the technology in cockpit, cockpits today, for instance, like um, the Garmin 1000 or any of those um, PFDs that you find in, in or MFDs that you find in, in a general aviation aircraft, the the the, ca- the, the operator's manual or the owner's manual may just stress on the buttonology, how to get from one menu to another. Now, once applications are added, you as the user have to figure out how to interpret and how that information inform your decision-making. So my, my take is the answer is yes. And I, I, would, I would stress the pilots that if you're gonna use technology, 
you learn it on the ground. Um, you know, Garmin, I'm not trying to promote any, any company, but there are a lot of companies out there that have displays. They do have um, simulators that you can find online where you can actually navigate through the system and get yourself more comfortable about how to use that system. Um, obtain the proper training on basically how to use the display and, you know, only display what you need. You know, there's no standalone weather display, even if it's on an iPad. You probably have a, a map overlaid or something on it or your route of flight. Um, but you have to be able to just display that information that you need. Um, vendors also, I, I, I put the onus on them that they need to um, be cognizant of the displays that they, they put out there and try to make them a bit more user friendly. But in the, at the end of the day, it's the user's responsibility. I always throw it back on, on, on you. It's the onus on you as a pilot. You know, it's like your car, right? Or let's look at a smartphone. Most of us, we buy a smartphone. We want to learn everything we can do with that phone. So you're not going to crash using the phone. So if, you, if you're going to fly an airplane, you need to know everything about that airplane and all the systems that are aboard that airplane, more so how to use the web information to the best of your ability. Thank you. Thank you. John, do, do you think there's any way that... Um any recommendations on how not to suffer from information overload in this situation when you have too much technology? I think uh, going back to Ian's uh, example, getting a new phone, when to learn all the new uh, capabilities of it, you're not going to learn everything about a new phone while you're driving. So know the capabilities of your system before you take off. Um, a lot of the weather products that you can get while in flight they could have latency. So if they're reported every 10, 20, 30 minutes, if you're basing your flight off of that, you need to know that the weather that you're looking at is something is the what the weather was like 15 minutes ago. Um, you don't want to spend too much time with your head down in the, in the cockpit looking through different products and trying to access uh, more things. Everything is uh, related to overall workload. So the more things that you add into what you're doing, the more attention you're taking away from your pilotage and uh, the rest of your operations. Thank you. Paul, do you have a comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the information overload thing because there's no shortage of information out there. Um, when I've been teaching some of the more advanced displays. Um, Ian mentioned, you know, Garmin 1000 or Garmin 750 or something like that. But there's like five ways to change a frequency. And that might be a nice thing to know. But what I encourage my students is, um, here's the options, pick one and stay with it. And I kind of have the same comment about this. If you have a weather provider that you're happy with, learn to use that provider and master it and resist the temptation to say, well, I have to learn everything about every product out there because um, first, it'll be confusing. And second, it will just take too much time. So I, I like the options, um, knowing what they are. But I'm a big believer in, uh, especially from an instructing standpoint, is to encourage our students to find, find what works for your situation and then stick with it. Yeah, thank you. We had a comment about this on the Q&A as well regarding whether we've thought about recommendations on how to select the, the sources and the checklist themselves. And one of the things I've learned over the years that everybody learns different and how they want their displays, how big they like it, what colors they like, the functionality of the app, it all makes a difference. So it's very difficult from us, from our standpoint to tell people, hey, this is better than this because it, it will be a very personal decision. And I also recommend talking to your CFI, that's step number one. And if you're past that stage or you don't feel comfortable asking your CFI because you already know you don't like the sources that your CFI uses, maybe talk to other pilots that may tell you, hey, I use this app because of this, this, and this, or I use this website because it has this functionality and I like it better. And eventually, like you said, find something, stick with it, and that doesn't mean that later you can reinvestigate and try to figure something else out and, and improve your process uh, continuously. And 
in this uh, technology wave, I am going to go back to Jeff and ask about some of the flight service investments in technology and in innovation that has been, have been made in recent years. Sure. Um, so we've had a lot going on uh, over at Flight Service. Uh, one of the biggest projects that we've had uh, lately has been the uh, uh, voice over internet protocol, uh, where we've looked to take all of our air to ground frequencies and uh, convert those uh, into VOIP. Uh, that's uh, really going to give us a lot of improved reliability, stability, co coverage. Uh, so we really heard uh, the feedback when uh, pilots said, hey, uh, this RCO works you know, 50% of the time. Uh, so we are working on that and, and we're getting close. Um, third party gateways for flight plans and weather briefings. Uh, we've got, uh, I think 40 plus uh, third party vendors uh, that we work with. Uh, and those companies have the ability uh, to sign up with us and you can go into your profile and so again, even if you do use uh, some of these uh, third party vendors, um, uh, or, or apps, uh, you can go on to your free flight service account and uh, uh, authorize us to communicate with those vendors so that if you do feel the need to call, uh, the specialist can see what you've done uh, on, on that app or with that vendor. Um, excuse me, our IVR. Everybody likes water. All right. Our IVR, uh, our IVR is our phone uh, uh, call director system. So when you call in, uh, you get the automated voice. Uh, you can activate and close your flight plans through that phone automation. We have several different avenues for you to activate and close your flight plans. Um, our IVR will also route your calls via area code. Uh, this is a new feature and we're watching this closely. Uh, this was put in uh, in an effort to uh, minimize um, misrouted calls uh, due to uh, voice recognition errors. Uh, we have our interactive map on our uh, website uh, powered by SkyVector. And but you're going to find some things on our interactive map that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, pilots traditionally told us, uh, hey, we call flight service because your specialists have local area knowledge that uh, we can't get anywhere else. Uh, so uh, we sat down and what we did, we took all of the training materials that we use for our briefers and we encapsulated all of that and we put it on the interactive map on our website. So when you go to the layers control on the top right, you're gonna see two options, one for weather and one that says other. And I'm still working on a better name uh, than other. But uh, when you click on that other tab, uh, you're gonna see uh, several different categories and you can go through and read almost textbook quality uh, descriptions on how the local topography and terrain uh, affect the weather uh, for wherever you may be flying and uh, general weather patterns for uh, whatever state you happen to be flying in. Again, that's all available to you now. Um, let's see, we have uh, priority service available to you as well. Not a lot of pilots know about this. Uh, if you, uh, so what that means, if you go online and you, you there's three things that you can do uh, to get priority service if you feel the need to call a specialist after you've uh, generated a self-briefing. Uh, you can file a flight plan. Again, you can generate that online briefing. Uh, either one of those actions will give you priority service when you, if you call in. Uh, and the last thing you can do, you can go to our interactive uh, map and there's a graphical checklist on the far left uh, that will uh, take you through each weather item uh, almost like a briefing on that interactive map. And once you submit that uh, and log that uh, interactive checklist, uh, that will also give you that priority service. So what that does, if you call in and you've completed one of those three actions, the computer will recognize that uh, on your phone and jump you to the front of the waiting line. So that, that feature is there available for you as well. Um, the go no go decision aids we talked about a little bit earlier with the uh, go no uh, excuse me the evaluate departure tool 
Um, and again, we just have multiple delivery modes available to you. Uh, phone, uh, our website, uh, we have text capabilities with Easy Activate, Easy Close. Uh, Easy Activate, Easy Close uh, may be the best thing that we've ever come out with. Uh, the ability to activate and close your VFR flight plans via text. Uh, that has cut down on a ton of uh, uh, needless search and rescue operations. Uh, that's been great. Uh, you can also text uh, 358-782. I'll say that again uh, for those listening. 358-782. Uh, and you can request METARs, TAFs, or adverse condition updates for your flight plan if you have one on file. Uh, uh, really ad hoc. Uh, and, and you'll get a METAR or TAF uh, texted back to you. Um, Oh gosh, uh, you can access our website from your smart device. Uh, just about everything except from a Nokia brick should work. Um, we've got uh, ACAS, Adverse Condition Alerting Service. So, um, hey, I generated a briefing a few hours ago. Has anything changed since that time? Uh, that, that tool helps you out with that. Uh, you can request uh, METARs and TAFs uh, through Alexa and Google. That service is free as well. Everything we do is free. Uh, you can also get the area forecast discussion, which is a very useful tool uh, through that service. And um, the last couple of things that I have for you, uh, surveillance enhanced search and rescue. Uh, we have those services available, uh, software that you can install in your aircraft that sends us periodic uh, position reporting. Uh, lots of references and help tools on our website. If you're having trouble with NOTAMs, there's a contraction decoder uh, under the help tab. Um, Gosh, every chart legend you can think of. And uh, lastly, uh, and we're still developing this, but uh, we are planning on uh, integrating the weather cams into our interactive map so that pilots can click on a location, click on a camera, and uh, take a look at it uh, through a, a pop-up window. And uh, But I'll let uh, Cole talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. As you heard from uh, Jeff, uh, within the different divisions of flight service, we're always looking at uh, new innovations and in technology and and uh, ways that we can improve aviation safety for the pilots. Um, a couple of things specifically that, uh, and, and there's more than a couple, are, we have great engineers and they're always wanting to uh, play around and find the next shiny toy, but uh, a couple of things that the weather camera program is working on currently, um, we're in the process of testing a new 360 degree uh, camera technology that would allow pilots to uh, not only see you know, certain areas within an area, but uh, would be able to see in a 360 degree area around their camera service area. And they'd be able to pan around um, and see everything in the area, seeing everything from the, the ground to the sky and everything in between. And that could be paired with uh, a, te a textual weather data, um, such as a METAR, uh, and give the pilots a complete picture of the weather in the area. And uh, specifically, I mean, this, this could be at airports, but it also, um, we kind of target areas like, uh, mountain passes or unmanned airports where there's no other weather information in the area. So um, we're definitely looking at that technology and, and expanding that wherever we can or wherever the need is. Um, and we're also we're always looking at uh, new power solutions and new envir environmentally friendly solutions. Uh, we're looking at a new power technology that would uh, um, allow us to uh, put battery operated uh, systems in different areas where um, currently we can't that would uh, definitely enhance our service delivery to the public within Alaska. And, uh, you know, not only in Alaska, we're also working on several avenues that would uh, continue our expansion and uh, provide our, our camera safety benefits to uh, Hawaii and the CONUS. And yeah, Frank, you just brought up a slide here. Um, so, that, so this is our, our uh, uh, current map of what we have. Um, so for weather cameras, we really do build on the go or no go that you've he heard a few times already. Um, from a couple of different panelists. But um, our mission, of course, um, as the weather camera pro program within flight services to improve aviation safety and efficiency within the NAS. And our, our goal is to reduce weather-related aviation accidents, to uh, reduce weather-related flight interruptions. Um, we don't want the pilots to have to fly out, take a look at an area, and then turn around and have to um, go back and waste all that uh, operational time. 
um, of course, to improve flight decision making and then to uh, enhance flight service operations. So we want to put the current weather conditions into the pilot's hands before they fly. Um, we don't want them to have to fly out, take a look at the area, and then have to decide if they want to fly through that area, which would, of course, elevate the chance of an aviation accident or have to turn around and waste those that flight time. So um, we're looking at alleviating both of those uh, um, those options. And could we go back one slide real quick? I wanted to touch on on just real quick. So this is currently what we have. Um, you can see most of the green dots there. And this is currently where we have weather cameras. We do have 236 cameras within Alaska. Uh, 230 of those are FAA owned, and then six of them are owned by um, other entities such as state DOTs. Um, we do have 11 currently owned. We're in the middle of an implementation of 26 new sites within Hawaii. Uh, so we're in the middle of that implementation. And then you can see where we've started to um, expand into the third third party sites into the lower 48. So we are looking into different options and, and, and looking at different avenues that currently we can um, start expanding into more states into the lower 48. We'd like to get these cameras in, in everywhere that, that there's a need. Um, and we're not just cameras, as you can see there on the bottom. And if you've uh, spent a lot of time on the website, uh, we also, not only do we provide camera images, but we provide um, METARs, TAFs, there's different satellite over overviews, uh, different RCOs, RCAGs, um, you can see all the different airports. So we're, we're moving towards a, a kind of a one flight service. We want to be able to provide pilots with um, a complete picture of the weather. We, we don't want to, we're not just cameras, we want to be able to um, com provide a complete visual and textual um, weather for the pilots. And next slide, please. So this kind of builds on our go or no go. Um, this is a site that we installed out of Ketchikan, Alaska. And as you can see for, for our cameras, um, each of our cameras has a, uh, most of our sites have four cameras, but they all have um, a clear day comparison image that goes along with the current image for um, comparison. Um, but this site's one that when we surveyed it, the pilots said it was a very common for them to fly out up to six or seven times a day, not be able to fly through this pass and have to turn around. Um, so as you can see there on the right, that's what they were looking at a lot of the time. And, and now what they can do is before they fly, they can look at the weather camera and decide if they do want to go or they do want to take the chance. So if the weather's marginal or if the weather's completely socked in, then they don't have to take the chance. They don't have to fly in the poor weather. Um, they don't have to make the decision to go if they believe they're not going to make it through. So um, we believe this has definitely helped in uh, not only the, the saving the uh, aviation incidents and, and saving the operational hours, but, but also um, reducing aviation accidents. So next slide. So our weather camera impact over the years, our first camera got installed um, around 1999, but in uh, 2007, um, we had a new business decision that uh, allowed us to install 140 new cameras across Alaska. And that's where you're gonna see that 85% uh, reduction in weather-related accidents and the 69% reduction in uh, weather-related flight and eruption hours. So um, during that time frame, during the implementation from 2007 to 2014, um, MITRE Co Corporation did a, an analysis to validate our, our cost of benefit cost to benefit ratio for the implementation. Um, and what they looked at was uh, um, weather-related ag aviation accidents per 100,000 hours of operation and weather-related flight interruption hours per, per 100,000 hours of operation. So um, there's a lot of numbers in there, but, but um, in the end, um, the baseline for the uh, weather-related aviation accidents per 100,000 hours of operation in 2007 was 0 0.28 per 100,000 hours. Um, by 2014, that number had dropped to uh, 0 0.04. So we saw over that time frame, and this is only within Alaska, um, an 85% reduction in weather-related aviation accidents. And the same with the uh, interrupt flight interruption hours. Um, the baseline for that in 2007 was 15,374 hours. Um, by the time we reached uh, completion of implementation in 2014, that actual number was 5,129. So during that time in Alaska, um, we showed a 69% reduction in that. Um, we did have some recommendations from the NTSB um, due to our success over the years. And in 2013, they had two, uh, three recommendations for us. Um, one was to initiate a weather camera program in Hawaii. 
Uh, one was to install and main cameras in mountain passes and uh, um, other areas of high, high uh, interest within CONUS. And the third was to equip flight service specialists with the um, with the capability to use our cameras for verbal pre-flight and in-route briefings. And with that, in, in 2019 and 2020, the uh, uh, Senate THUD Committee, um, they also encourage us to, to uh, proceed with the weather cameras in Hawaii and also in the CONUS. And, and that's what led to our 26 camera systems that we're, we're currently installing uh, within Hawaii. So I think we have one more slide. So program expansion. So um, if we could go out and, and install cameras at, at every place that I get a call for or or every place that I get an email for, we would love to do that. We, we would install cameras all across Alaska, all across the lower 48. Um, but of course, we always have the uh, the funding and the authorization and, and all these different things. So um, we are looking to expand. Um, we're in the process of a few different things. Um, we're, we're in the process of a third party hosting program with state DOTs where um, we host their cameras to uh, give pilots more uh, cameras in the lower 48 and in Alaska. And we're also in the process of a new business case where we can install hopefully up to 330 new FAA camera systems. And these are um, definitely the target. And, and we're looking at airports, of course, um, but our target is our, our target is more towards where there's no other weather information. So we're looking at, like I said, mountain passes. Uh, we're looking at a lot of heliports and, and hospitals um, where air ambulance operators have came to us and said they have an issue with being able to fly. Um, different areas, uh, such as lakes and rivers, float plane operations. Um, we're looking at areas like that. So not only are we going to be at airports, we're, we're trying to get our cameras and our, our complete weather picture at other areas where, um, you know, there's just no weather information for pilots. So. Well, thank you very much, Cole. I appreciate all the information. And if anybody has any additional feedback regarding the weather cameras, uh, had his email available. And as I said before, the presentation will be available. The entire webinar will be available later on on YouTube. You can get the information there. It'll also be available on the flight service website. And uh, now we have some time for questions from the audience. I'm going to start with Marilyn. Hey, Marilyn, uh, does the AC apply to UAS or advanced air mobility pilots? Well, that's an interesting question, Frankie. I'm glad you asked. And I've been working for probably close to 12 years in the drone area, uh, regulatory specialist for that when I was at the FAA. So when we wrote this, uh, we didn't really think in terms of applying it to UAS or now to AAM. But if you consider that we've been talking now for almost two hours about pilots um, maybe not being able to grasp all of the weather that they should and having misconceptions, misunderstandings. Well, these are aviators. So now if you look at drone operators who are not aviators, they could be anyone. And now we're going to ask them to understand weather. Uh, you can imagine that this is extremely difficult. And keep in mind also that these operations are generally speaking below 400 feet above the ground. And we don't have weather there. We don't have weather reporting in 97% of the CONUS. So what is the drone operator using? Well, a lot of people say, well, it's not really important to have weather because it's only local and I can, I can see it. So it's within line of sight. But what about if it isn't within line of sight and you're doing a beyond line of sight operation? Or what about turbulence? It's not something you can see even if you can see your drone. So some of the suggestions I would have, and, and we look at the requirements. Part 107 is the drone operator's regulatory requirement. That's a little bit different than the, the 91 requirements. Part 107 says that uh, the pre-flight familiarization, inspection, and actions for aircraft operation, they require the pilot in command to assess the operating environment, considering risks to persons and property in the immediate vicinity, both on the surface and in the air. And this assessment must include local weather conditions, local airspace, and any flight restrictions. So 
to some degree, this individual is going to have to learn how to use weather, but this inv individual may not need weather forecasting. They may need weather now casting. They're only flying for 15 minutes, maybe half an hour. Uh, they're not interested in what the weather is going to be forecast to be in six hours or three hours. They're going to fly right now. So what are the resources? What is that individual going to do? Um, we just heard Cole talk about weather cameras. I would suggest maybe the weather cameras could be a, a good resource. You can see what's happening in the area. I've had a lot of drone operators say, but I've got the local METAR. And I'll ask, well, how local is the METAR? And they may say 20 miles away. That's not local enough for the drone operation. The weather where you are could be quite different from where the METAR reported is. And we know that drone operators are not using airports. The weather forecasts come from airports. So this is something that uh, we need to look at. There are some standards organizations that are building standards for weather suppliers who may not be the National Weather Service, but they may be uh, providing weather that's satisfactory and will meet the needs of drone operators. So um, we know that there are some other sources. Um, Before You Fly is an FAA source. It's an app. Everyone has an app. Uh, we could look at a loft UAV forecast. Some of those could be resources for the drone operator. So there are means to get weather and it's a requirement. So drone operators, you shouldn't be saying, I'm only going to fly where I can see it. Please go out and get some weather, learn what those weather forecast charts and so on are requiring. There are also many weather questions on that part 107 knowledge exam. So you're going to be required to understand how to get a briefing, what charts are necessary, how to read those charts and how to interpret them for that low level flight if it's valuable information, and if it's not, where can you go to find information? And I would recommend that you call flight service. Ask flight service some questions. Maybe they'll be able to help you out with some information for that low level flying. Maybe they can help interpret local area weather if it's not something that's forecast or now cast for you. So use those folks as resources. They're there for you. Don't be afraid to keep asking questions. Again, I've said it before, if you wonder whether you should fly, you probably shouldn't. And that applies to the drones as well. So thanks, Frankie, for letting me talk a little bit about drones. Absolutely, thank you. I have a question here from Scott Lewis. Uh, he is asking if the wings force provide us with the actual assessment tool that we can use, or does it just give us a picture? Uh, for what I understand, Scott, the actual tool is not available in the wings course there is mention of it and uh, let's see we we talk about the i'm safe checklist within the course and the developing of a risk assessment but not the tool itself uh ian is there somewhere where folks can get the assessment tool that we talked about earlier are you talking up you're talking about the risk assessment tool that we mentioned yes yeah that that could be found in the fa risk assessment um management the risk management handbook it's um fa h80 83-2 and you can download that at the fa.gov website thank you you're welcome uh the next comment here i have that this ATP, CFI, CFII, MEI, and meteorologist has taught me more about weather and how to decipher weather briefing charts more than any other source I've found. And I see that Marilyn had a comment on that. I didn't necessarily have a comment, but I wanted to thank that individual. That's very kind for you to say. And that's exactly what we hope that we're imparting to you, information that you can use. Uh, we want you to learn. Thank you. And um, I'm not sure who will be best to address this, maybe Jeff 
or it maybe even in on your research and John, do you see that common route veteran pilots don't complete weather and route planning or is it more newer to pilots? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I'll answer first and then I'll let Jeff go. Based on our research, um, we, we, we find um, gaps in both veterans and um, student pilots, so pilots who are new to aviation. Um, I think some of it for veteran pilots may be complacency. You know, I've been there before, I know where I'm going. So, you know, I have a, a, a mental model, geographical location. Um, um, with a student pilot, you know, if you just finish doing your uh, private pilot license, get your private pilot ticket, you probably, and depending on how much weather you, you knowledge you have, you may still practice um, that good habit until you probably get a couple hours and then you start developing bad habits. So um, that's what we've seen in some of our research. So uh, I'll let Jeff chime in on here. I'm probably done. I was I was looking for the the actual question here to to reference, but I think the question was, uh, do we see a difference in in trends between uh, veteran pilots and new pilots and, and new pilots? Um, we certainly see a large call volume from newer pilots, uh, but. Uh, do, I don't know that we necessarily collect any data, but uh, from personal experience, so again, take this for what it is and, and with a large grain of salt, uh, there, there doesn't tend to be a whole lot of middle ground there. Uh, we see a, a lot of students, we see a lot of uh, experienced pilots, but uh, very rarely do we see those middle of the career uh, callers unless they're out doing GA flying. Uh, you know, Typically, they're with the the airlines or the charter companies, and they have their own folks that do that kind of thing. If, I, I think that kind of helps answer the question. Thank you, Jim. From your uh, from AOPA, have you seen any of this trend also happen? I know you do a lot of surveys. For, you do a yearly survey regarding weather, and one of the questions relates to the level of uh, knowledge and the training level that each pilot has. Have you seen a trend on this? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I know we do collect a lot of information in that weather survey. I, I don't have any of that uh, compiled uh, to share with you. I, I think I would agree. It's it's just anecdotally um, probably a pretty even spread. Uh, you know, you're always going to have folks that are more experienced pilots that don't feel like they need to do a self briefing, and then there are you know newer pilots that just don't really know how to do one. So. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be a, a pretty even split between the two populations as to doing or not doing briefings. But I, yeah, I don't have any empirical data uh, to be able to share, unfortunately. All right, thank you. I have, uh, let's see here, another question from Chris Dorsey asking about interested in weather related diversions. Is there a database of diversion data that you're aware of? Uh, I am not really sure, but I will take a look. The command center may have some of that information. And if I can find an answer for you, we're, we're going to collect the questions and I can send you a follow up later on. And let's see if we have anything else here. Have some feedback for the NWS and I will pass that along. I think that's uh, that's what we have. There may be a, a few stragglers that I'll take a look at. Like I said, we're going to review the questions. If there are any unanswered, we'll follow up with an email. Thank you very much for attending today. And I'm going to go back to Kathleen. She has a few closing comments. Well, I, mainly I just wanted to say thank you uh, to our panel panelists for providing uh your time and your expertise, and then to everyone out there, as well as for your time and for your engaging participation. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jim McClay for final closing marks. Okay, well, thank you, Kathleen. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, we, we certainly appreciated being able to participate in this webinar today. Uh, I think a, a lot of this came out of the results, as, as Kathleen mentioned earlier, um, out of the results from our weather survey that we've done. Uh, indicating kind of a lack of knowledge about the the AC, um, and um, so we're we're very pleased that this was able to be held today, and we appreciate everybody on the panel here. 
Um, we've been working pretty closely with FAA for some time now to try to highlight the importance of self briefings, um, both through the AC and then we've had involvement with the, the, the wings courses that have come out as well. And uh, we're, we're grateful to see those. Um, AOPA, as you all know, is, is always hyper focused on safety um, in all aspects of operating aircraft. And, and as was mentioned earlier, we, we consider pre flight planning to be you know, just as critical a pilot skill as, as other piloting skills that you might do in the cockpit. Um, we've seen a sea change over the last number of years in the way that pilots prepare themselves for, uh, for flights with the advent of mobile technologies we've discussed and, and uh, advanced avionics in the cockpit. And these tools have really changed pilot behavior. So this set of best practices that FAA has put forward in the AC and in the courses is very, very welcome. Um, we're, we're glad to see it and, and we're fully in support of it. Uh, we do have some work ahead of us. Um, there are a lot of folks out there still that are not aware of uh, AC 9192. And uh, so we, we want to try to change that. Uh, today's webinar was part of that effort. Uh, AOPA is going to continue our outreach efforts, but I, I want to throw it out to the pilot community here uh, and ask you to help us in, in uh, making other pilots aware of uh, AC 9192 and, and uh, share with them, hey, it's not a big, scary document. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a great resource and easy to read um, and uh, help us spread the word about it. So that's all I have. Uh, again, thank you, FAA, for hosting this and uh, thanks everyone for watching.